Welcome, everybody. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Tim Lorick. I am an assistant professor in the Department of History and Politics here at the College of St. Scholastica. Whether you are a regular at our events or a first-time visitor, we welcome you and hope you find tonight's conversation timely and worthwhile. Tonight's event is the fourth installment of the 2022-23 series of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice at the College of St. Scholastica. Our theme for this year is resilience, urgent conversations, local voices. If you missed our first event with Emily Ford and featuring the CSS Justice Choir, or our second event on voting rights, or our third event on public health, all of these can be found on our YouTube page. Just search Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice, and it'll pull up a listing. Tonight, we're gathering to discuss resilience and climate change. Today, February 2nd, Groundhog Day, marks the halfway point between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. On a cold night in northern Minnesota, the idea of a hibernating groundhog emerging to see its shadow may seem far-fetched. But we observe the returning of light in other ways, the increasing calls of chickadees and the intensifying red of the dogwood. Many cultures across the northern hemisphere have celebrations to mark the midway point between solstice and equinox. In that spirit, we are glad that you are joining us today in community and conversation. We note the urgency of today's topic. In March, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is due to release its synthesis of its sixth assessment report. At the COP27 meeting last fall in Egypt, countries adopted a loss and damage reparations fund for the first time. Meanwhile, in the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 established new investments and credits related to climate change, remediation, and renewable energy. What does all of this mean? How might these developments affect communities here in the Northland? We're delighted to have two speakers actively engaging in these questions and in this work in our region through solar energy and installation and seed saving. We hope to have an insightful conversation with them and our recent graduates, current students, and community leaders working on environmental issues who are here with us tonight. Before we proceed, I have a few brief notes of recognition and thanks. So these events are made possible first and foremost by the Allworth family, Karen and Royal Allworth. This series is also funded by the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Evra Foundation and the Mary C. Van Evra Foundation Endowed Fund in memory of William Van Evra. Additional support comes from the Global Awareness Fund of the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, the Royal D. Allworth Jr. Institute for International Studies at the University of Minnesota Duluth, and the UMD Department of World Languages and Cultures, along with other private donors. So here's how tonight's going to work. We're going to first hear a short lecture on solar energy by Robert Blake, and then we will next hear a short presentation on seeds and community agriculture from Jessica Greendeer. After that, we'll open it up to all of you for questions and discussion. When we come to it, please walk up to the microphones and line up behind one either on either side of the auditorium. Uh, if you prefer to remain in place, simply raise your hand and one of us will come and find you with a microphone. Okay, so Robert Blake is founder and CEO of Solar Bear. He's the owner of Solar Bear. He, uh, it, it's a solar installation company located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Also, Robert is the executive director of Native Sun Community Power Development, a nonprofit likewise located in Minneapolis. Robert is a tribal citizen of the Red Lake Nation. His passion is spreading the word about renewable energy through communication cooperation, and collaboration. Okay, the floor is yours. Anine Boujou, miigwech, thank you have for having me tonight, everyone. Um, this is such an honor to be here. Please time me. <laughs> um, I get a little long-winded. I get really passionate about solar, and especially when I'm talking about it. Um, but, um, First of all, I just want to say that um, we are living in incredible times, as probably a lot of you know it. And um, 
the advancements in renewable energy is simply incredible. Uh, something that was new today um, is going to be old tomorrow, literally. <laughs> and and um, it's kind of like Moore's Law, right? Where like things get better every couple of years, right? They get more efficient. Um, technology gets better and better. And I don't think our smartest people, um, and there's a bunch of them out there, could have seen uh, what is transpiring today in the marketplace. You are seeing traditional money that was invested in fossil fuels, um, you know, uh, just rush, rushing into renewables right now. There isn't a day that I don't talk to investment bankers from New York. <laughs> I mean, that is the truth. There isn't a day that I'm not talking to, uh, you know, um, just people that are asking me, hey, you know, what's the trajectory of, you know, uh, utility scale projects in tribal country, right? Like, it, it's just incredible. So, um, to that end, um, I, I just want to say that um, this has been um, simply uh, an incredible um, ride that um, I've been on for the last seven years. Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, it, it, it coincides with, I believe, the biggest existential crisis that we have ever faced in our existence of, of, of mankind, you know. Um, and climate change is real, people. And, 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 and the science, of course, tells us this. Um, and I am a person of faith. Okay, I know this is Saint Scholastica. I've been baptized. I've been confirmed. I've been, uh, oh boy, uh, first communion. <laughs> the three, right? The fourth is getting married, right? That's the I, I'm not married, but so. But I did those the, the first three. Um, so, um, but um, you know, uh, getting back to the point of just. You know, th this this is is something that you know is is really tugs at me from a cultural perspective, in the way that I believe uh, my 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 people, Native people, have uh, you know lived at one with the planet, lived at one with the environment, and and have tried to think seven generations ahead, um, and on a faith side as, as a Christian. Um, you know, I think this tugs at me in a sense of like, you know, uh, that we need to take care of, you know, God's creation, right? So those are the two intersections that really kind of, were, were, were really kind of, uh, kind of intersect for me um, in, those, in this work that I do. And I really do believe that um, the transportation system um, is killing the planet. Um, our, our fossil fuel boxes on wheels is, is destroying the planet. And so um, what, uh, what I would like to do, everyone, is I would like to build electric vehicle charging networks across the country. And what happened was, um, I just want to tell you a quick story. Uh, we were protesting Line 3 um, down south here a little bit. And we were standing, we were standing out on the front and we were holding our signs and it was really hot, mosquitoes everywhere and everything, you know. We were all talking and we were like, hey, um, there's got to be a better way to do this. <laughs> there's got to be a better way to do this. And so we got on our phones and we were looking for different grants to apply for and we found this grant. Uh, and we put together a grant to uh, create an intertribal electric vehicle charging network to uh, show resistance, right, to resist the fossil fuel infrastructure and to give people a choice. And, and so we, we went and applied for it, and I'm happy to say that Native Sun was war awarded $6.7 million by the Department of Energy to create this intertribal electric vehicle charging network that runs from the Twin Cities to St. Paul, uh, that runs from the Twin Cities to the Red Lake Nation, to Standing Rock, and back to the, back to the Twin Cities. And the point that I wanted to make in this application 
was that if these guys are going to build pipelines, that we'll build an electric vehicle charging network pipeline and we'll give people the choice of what they want to do. And so <laughs> I was told by the Department of Energy that that was their most favorite submission. <laughs> we were the highest awarded submission in the country. And uh, Vice President Harrison, uh, uh, Department of Energy Secretary Granholm made the announcement and when they mentioned, out in Pennsylvania, by the way, and when they made the announcement, I nearly just like fell off my chair. I was like, ah. <laughs> so um, there's one piece. Um, there's a project that I've been working on for the last, um, oh boy, five years, four years, with a good friend of mine, Ralph Jacobson. And uh, we've been putting together a project up in Red Lake called the Red Lake Solar Project. And um, what we are trying to do, everyone, is we're trying to build 400 megawatts of renewable energy of solar. We're trying to create a tribal utility, and um, we, uh, we have agreements. I've been working on an agreement with the Minnesota Department of Transportation for the last year and a half um, to sell uh, energy to the MnDOT, and um, they're going to buy it. And this is really exciting because um, this is one of the first times that the state is purchasing energy from a tribal nation. This is, this is the first time. And so what I'm trying to do is clear the way for other tribes to do this too. And with other state agencies, by the way. And so this is a very technical um, thing called virtual power purchase agreement, power purchase agreements. Um, and i um, been working with the, with the University of Minnesota on this project, and it, it's been going really good. And it's exciting because we're also creating a tribal utility. So we're creating our own utility. And in this process, um, when I first started working with the law firm that was creating, that was helping us do the legal work on this, um, there was only, I think, three of us, I want to say two or three of us that were working with them around the country. Now there's close to 80 tribal nations that are now working with this law firm to create their own tribal utility. Now, a friend of mine told the principal of that law firm, hey, you should give Bob Lake a piece of your law firm because he's brought me so much, so, so much business. But this is really exciting because the idea here is that tribes create their own utilities and, you know, we can then create um, our own Tribal Utilities Commission that worked in conjunction with the Public Utilities Commission. And there is a, currently a House file, 1647, that is with the state of Minnesota that will help us create a Tribal Energy Advisory Board. I've been working on that for five years. And so, um, and, and Minnesota will be the first in the country to have this. So, you know, I don't think we think about how powerful or how much money is made by the utilities. Um, I know Red Lake probably sends about $35 million off the reservation each year to the, to the local co-op. And I was explaining to the tribe, what if we put that $35 million back into our community? What would that look like? Because I firmly believe that a human health crisis is happening in tribal country, and I think the cure to it is renewable energy. And what I'm really trying to do, people, is I am trying to attack poverty. Because at, uh, at the very part of these disparities that is affecting these communities, I believe poverty is the, is the root cause of it. So if I can attack that, create jobs, create opportunities, um, you know, I believe that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start seeing a lot of these disparities that are plaguing these communities fall to the wayside. And that's why um, I love solar because I could teach solar to anyone. I could teach solar to all of you, and you can get it. As a matter of fact, when we, when we started doing this project, we, our first project was, seven, was a 70, it was an 80 kilowatt project on top of the Red Lake Government Center. And we had 10 tribal members on this project that we hired to work on this, with us um, on this project. And it was, I think it was 7 a.m., and I remember having all the guys show up on the job site, and I looked around and I was like, wow, all 10 of these guys are here on time. <laughs> it's incredible. Like, I'm onto something. I stumbled into something. 
I stumbled into purpose, everyone. I stumbled into purpose is what I stumbled into. These guys knew that it was something more than just a job for the community. They knew that it was making the environment better. And someone told, one of the guys told me, I feel great about this because it's helping our community and it's, and it's helping the environment. Damn, did I just stumble on something here. So I knew that I had to do more of this and, and, and that's how come I've been so passionate about this, um, about this work. And um, since, um, uh, you know, I've been doing this stuff. Um, I've been able to train inmates down the road here at Willow River Correctional Facility. So the idea here was to fight climate change with mass incarceration, fight mass incarceration with climate change. The guys at Standing Rock that were against all the protesting and everything heard about what I was doing, had me out there to do some training for tribes around re renewable energy and solar. Um, and um, we ended up uh, uh, having a Rolling Stone article written about us, and that was the front page article in uh, U.S. Energy News. And then it's just been a it's just been a, a roller coaster ever since, so to speak. So uh, that's my that's been my solar journey. Um, and um, we uh, oh by the way, Solar Bear by the way was awarded the forty six million dollar project down in Prairie Island. I don't know if you guys have heard about the Net Zero project. Solar Bear was awarded that project with Kenobel Surf Electric. Um, and so we're also working on that. Um, and of course, we're working on um, the project here in Red Lake um, for the uh, 400 megawatts. So um, uh, I, I, I tell, uh, I always get asked by different tribes or like, I always tell people, I always tell the tribes, you know, we're, we're in the gaming business, which is a billion dollar business. We need to be in the energy business, and that's a trillion dollar business. We are in the wrong business, people. And so um, I think that I started getting calls after the pandemic because everybody saw their drop in the casino starting to go down, and they were like, hey, 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 call, let's call that solar guy back. <laughs> he makes sense. He makes a lot of sense. We should talk to him. The sun does shine every day. We can make money every day. So um, this has been really exciting. Um, I want to thank Senator Tina Smith and her staff um, for listening to my ideas and um, getting them into the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, Dr. Pete Wyckoff, um, incredible, incredible man um, who really worked hard on the direct pay provision that uh, really is beneficial to tribal nations who are developing solar and renewable energy projects um, and, and um, of course, uh, for nonprofits. Um, and, and not to get into the, the, the quantity, like how do we finance these things, and because I know it's a lot there, but um, you know, um, this, 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 we can't do this work without finance. Um, I used to work for Ameriprise Financial, and I remember uh, my instructor telling me, um, uh, everything takes finance. Without, you, you can't do nothing without finance. So just, I was stuck in the back of my mind. But with renewable energy projects, especially solar, um, we did we need finance so um, the government stepping up the way they have the federal government with the IRA Act has been incredible and has been very beneficial um, to, 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 to tribal communities so um, that's a big kind of overview of what I do with Native Sun with Solar Bear um, I do a lot of policy work too um, everyone uh, please contact your senator I think you guys got Jim McEwen up here right um, and um, uh, please contact your senator or your state senator and have them uh, uh, vote for the 100% um, uh, uh, campaign. Um, it did pass the House this last week, and, and um, of course this is going to be good for Minnesota, um, and this will also uh, be able to create a lot of jobs and opportunities um, in the renewable energy uh, industry for Minnesotans. So um, if I could just get that little out there for everyone. And I don't want to take up all the time. Uh, okay, I got some more time left okay um and let me go through the red lake solar project real quick um is there is this the clicker okay all right everyone i just want to let you know that um uh that we started the red lake solar project because we found mercury a lot of mercury in the in the lake in red lake and so our, our biggest and oldest business was the fishery which we would uh fish walleye harvest walleye out of there and we found high, mar high amounts of mercury content. Where's that mercury coming from? Might be coming from North Dakota, right? 
Yeah, that's probably where it's coming from. Um, anyways, um, I, I, did a, I did a speech out in um, the, the, the uh, Mandan Hadatsa Rikara Nation, uh, Fort Berthold, and uh, told them, I said, hey, you guys got to do something about this. <laughs> You're ruining our fresh water over in Red Lake. Um, but this is why uh, we, we wanted to look into renewable energy. Um, this were, these were some of the goals. Um, and, and, and I think the big part here was, was the training and the job creation. So creating that power source for the community so that will create jobs and opportunities and there'll be a ripple effect, right? So other, other industries will be able to tack onto it. So uh, circular economy, think. Um, and, and of course, you know, these were some of the questions that we had to do and we had to do a feasibility study. Uh, this has been incredible. Um, we, we, we were, we got storage, we've got solar now, um, and of course we're looking into uh, doing the utility stuff right now. Um, this is our, some of the, some of the questions, um, some of the things that we had to do, considerations. Um, these were some of the things that we found out. Um, uh, it's been difficult working with the co-op up here. Um, I understand the electric company's um, position. Uh, we're, we're, we're basically eating their cake, um, and no one wants their cake to be eaten um, because uh, solar is, um, is happening. But I think there was a story that just came out about Elite Clean Energy, which is a subsidiary of Minnesota Power, and um, they're um, going to be uh, buying a bunch of transmission, big transmission lines running out to Montana. Um, and uh, so uh, just to let you know, everyone, that uh, the idea there is that, you know, we can't control um, the deployment of solar and renewable energy, but what we can control is the queue and the transmission lines in which they flow. So that's why that's happening, everyone. Um, this was part of the daily load versus solar. We call this the duck model. As you can see, during the, during the daytime, that's when all the solar is being produced. What are you going to do with all that? We need storage. So we, we, we've included batteries now. And of course, um, the utility ain't gonna buy back the power from us. Um, this was some of the uh, buildings that we were looking at, and this is some of the usage, um, and of course, how much solar we can put on the buildings, um, and of course, the, the duck curve again. Uh, we wanna do this in phases, casino, hotel campuses. This was the first building that we did. Um, I did a podcast with, um, with a, a group out of London, England, and they couldn't stop talking about this eco building and the solar on top of it and how inspiring that was. And I thought that was really cool. I was like, hey, you should put that on the palace if you think it's inspiring, then put solar on, <laughs> on the Queen's Palace. That, um, of course, these are just the layouts of the solar. Uh, this is the timeline. These are the phases. These are the stages of them. Um, this is all, just, if, if uh, anybody in here, um, construction management, you're going to recognize all that, all those, all those GAN charts. Uh, this was the first finance model that we had for it. Um, and then, of course, that was um, me and Ralph's information. Um, and I want to answer a couple of these questions here real quick. Um, I don't want to take all the time here because I know Jessica's got to get up here. Um, what is the role of, uh, I want to, the first one here is, how can historically marginalized and or lower income communities build climate change resilience? Just like I said, um, renewable energy, job training, workforce development. Um, there is a thing called energy poverty, and it's real. Um, and, um, you know, that's something that um, we need to attack. And there are a lot of great provisions in the IRA Act, and there's a lot of great things in this 100% campaign. So legislatively, policy-wise, that's where U.S. voters can really help us out at. And because those dollars will go to those communities. So that, that is the first question. Second question is, what is the role of institutions? What can an institution like the College of St. Scholastica do to build climate change resilience? I think you're doing it. I, I, I really do. I mean, I, I think it's the youth. I, I think it's all the students. I, I, I really do believe that it starts with you know, individuals. I sat around and thought to myself, somebody better do something about this climate change problem. Um, and you know, I just thought to myself, boy, I should create a company called Solar Bear. You know? um, and then I thought to myself, man, you know, I, I, I got to create a nonprofit. Um, I created a nonprofit. Um, I better run for public office. Um, you know, I got to get an advanced degree, right? Like I did all of the above. Um, and it, it, it's this passion of climate change and this urgency that I have inside of me that has really driven me. And I think that will really drive, will really drive all of you. Um, 
And let's get some solar on top of these buildings here in Saint Scholastica. I think that would be really cool. Um, and what new opportunities are there in the current political moment? Um, think about the Inflation Reduction Act and the latest credits for solar, et cetera. Um, yeah, everyone, the, the, the RA Act, the, the IRA Act, um, the, the bill, um, I, you know, someone was talking to me about this. I was like, yeah, man, man, my, my, my Jewish uncles, man, IRM Bill, man, they're, they're, they're really helping me out here. Um, the, you know, that, that, the, those, that has been incredible, everyone, the, the IRA Act and, 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 and the, um, and, and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and, and, and those provisions in there. It's not a lot if you look at the big scope of it, but man, just that historical investment. This has been the biggest investment around climate change that we've ever had, everyone. So I think that we are doing it. I think President Biden and his cabinet are doing it. Um, I was invited out to Washington, D.C. to speak to all the tribes at the Department of Energy Conference. Um, bucket list thing. Um, it was incredible. Um, I got to talk to the National Congress of American Indians. I mean, it, it, it was a really wonderful experience, and um, I'm just really excited for, for the opportunities and for the investment that's coming at the tribal country. We have a lot of issues that we're working with FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, around interconnection, around being in the queue. Um, those are things that are just happening. Transmission is happening, too, all across the country. Um, and so, um, you know, tribes really need to uh, be up on this stuff because these lines are going to be going through their territory. As a matter of fact, Minnesota Power had to bring a big transmission line through our territory, um, carrying hydro from Manitoba into Duluth, um, and they were going to have to reroute that line. And that was going to cost millions and millions and millions of dollars to the ratepayers of Minnesota Power. But you want to know something? They cut a deal with Red Lake. So they were able to build that line right through. So we're going to hook up our renewable energy to that line now. And that is a good thing. But now that I think back to it now, we should have became part owners of that thing. <laughs> but, but my point being here is that we don't want tribes to be able to be taken advantage of. And that's why the Tribal Energy Advisory Council is so important in the state of Minnesota. And that's what I hope that we, um, that we get past here. Um, and that's what I'm tirelessly working on. Um, and then we get this out to all other 50 states. Um, and uh, I think that was 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Robert Blake. Uh, so next we will hear from Jessica Greendeer, seed keeper and farm manager with Dream of Wild Health. Jessica is a Ho-Chunk Ho Nation tribal member from Baraboo, Wisconsin, our shared hometown, <laughs> and a member of the Deer Clan. Jessica is excited to be able to share her life work of growing and protecting our seed relatives, her desire to regenerate the soils of our earth, and she is grateful for the opportunity to train and inspire future seed keepers. Jessica has worked as the agricultural division manager for her nation and had previously served as a garden mentor within her nation's organic community gardens. She's a US Army combat veteran and completed a veteran to farmer training program at Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. Jessica Green Deer. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here with you all today. Um, it's always um, it's always an uplifting experience to be surrounded by like-minded people um, and I know we have a couple people spread out in here but how many of you grow a garden all right well that's great that's really great um, <laughs> so you know like climate change um, climate change and climate chaos I'm probably not going to tell you anything brand new. Um, this is a problem that we've all inherited um, and myself included have contributed to, but now is the time for us to make changes. Um, change the way, change what we drive, change uh, where we're purchasing our food from. Um, you know, we think about um, the amount of miles that the average box of cereal travels is 1,900 miles. and that 
is incredible. And for those of you cereal eaters here, um, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, so do whatever you gotta do. Um, but you know, it's something to consider when you're looking at your food system and how, how that affects everybody. Um, I work at Dream of Wild Health, and it's a place where we take, um, I don't wanna say take, we bring urban native youth from the Twin Cities urban space, and they come out to a farm in Hugo, which is approximately 35 miles northeast of the Twin Cities. At that farm, um, ages eight to 18, youth learn how to grow food, they learn how to forage, they also learn how to prepare those meals using those ingredients inside of our kitchen. And there's so many different avenues that we're trying to convey, and climate change is one of those big things that we talk about. It would be, I would not be doing my job or my due diligence if I said, here you go kids, climate change, like how are you, what are you gonna fix? You know, it's not, um, it's not a problem that they need to inherit, it's something that we can still continue to make changes uh, and actions to combat against. So that way they don't have such a large problem that they're inheriting. When I think about uh, the work that I do revolves not only around mentoring and coaching um, aspiring farmers um, and aspiring chefs, um, you know, that are are quite a lot of bit, <laughs> quite a lot younger than I am. Um, but to know that they want to take an active role in how how we do things in this world today, and how are they going to make it different? And it's incredible to hear our young leaders at the age of 14 have these tremendous ideas of things that they want to be able to put into action, and that sometimes we just need to remember that the people we listen to are not always older than us. Sometimes they're the ones coming right behind us. The work that I do in the field is with our ancestral seeds. Um, and so those are heirloom, open pollinated varieties of seed. For all of you gardeners, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, but those ancestral seeds are coming out of places like museums, institutions, um, and public seed houses, and back into the home communities. So this particular variety that I have who joined me today um, is a variety that the last time she grew was 1951. And why she came with me is I think about just how different things were the last time she saw the sun uh, before she was regrown last year. The work that we, you know, it's, we can sit and look at the negatives that we're inheriting, but we also need to remember that there's our, there are tons of positive things. Um, we have solutions that we can find to fix the situations that we found ourselves in as a species, um, but we also have different opportunities that present themselves for us to continue to grow together. I, <clears throat> I you know, came home from the army and wanted to learn how to change our food system. A simple task. Um, <laughs> and so changing our food system is a, is a lot. It means so many different things to everybody in this room. For me, changing my food system was looking at the health and welfare of my tribal members and my tribal community and wanting to fix those health disparities and knowing that so many of the diseases that um, my people are, are ailed with or uh, suffering from are diet related. And so how do we change that? Um, and thinking of all of the different multi-pronged approaches of like, maybe we can just do this. Um, and as a veteran, you know, I think it's like putting a, a Band-Aid on a, on a gushing chest wound, you know, it's, we're still not addressing the symptom or the, the root problem of everything. And so it's up to us to try to find and discover those different prongs um, and how each and every one of us has our own way and our own method, whether you realize it or not, on how you can truly make a change and help impact and find solutions for the problem that we're in. Um, this is a problem that affects everyone um, from people who 
have no job or are in poverty to the people who have millions and millions of dollars. It doesn't matter how much money we have or where we're living, the problem is going to affect us in some way, whether that's um, right at our front door or including our food system. Uh, with climate chaos, we have um, unpredictable growing seasons. Um, and I can't believe how much snow is up here. I know you're further north, <laughs> so I should expect more snow, but um, as we were driving, driving in, seeing the snow piled up to the bottom of the stop sign was amazing to me. It was incredible. Um, and I'm sure you all see that and um, you know either uh, curse that or enjoy that every year. Um, but you know, no matter how much snow we have, there's still that unpredictability. Um, no matter how many times Punxsutawney Phil sees the shadow. And what I'm asking of all of you today is to think about how you can make a change. It's more of a call to action. You know, there's lots of ways that we can make those changes. And I know Bob had mentioned transportation being a big issue. I'm also not asking everybody to go out and purchase an electric vehicle. Um, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that for every action or inaction lays out a whole line of different consequences for us. And whether we use our voices to talk about it uh, to within our spheres of influence or we decide not to, both of those have consequences. Um, all I can do is continue to grow seed uh, and try to continue to grow food. And that's, I'm not gonna say it's my superpower, but that's what I was put here to do. Um, after realizing that, after so many different careers in my lifetime, uh, to finally come to that. But with climate chaos, that affects our food system. And whether you are buying your produce or growing your own, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things happening where our food comes from. Um, None of us can go outside right now and probably find a spot of green. Um, we know it's under there somewhere, but it's something that we can't uh, go outside, dig out, and probably share for dinner. Um, you know, the places in this country that our food is coming from are experiencing climate chaos, uh, whether it's flooding or a lack of water um, out in the West. That is a that's a majority of where our food comes from, and we won't find out until the month of April whether or not the flooding in California has affected um, and truly impacted our agriculture for the country. And that's not something we talk about. Um, it's, it's something a little scary, but it's something that we all have to embrace collectively. Um, I'm scared, um, and it's okay to be scared. Um, but I'm also trying to find the solutions in all of that. You know, like, what is the solution to that? And I can't tell you the answer. I know what the answer is for me, um, what the choices are that I can make, but I also know that I can't grow food for every single person in this room um, and provide enough food for you all for the year. However, we can all grow our own gardens and start participating in an act of resistance to be able to grow our own food and steward the earth that we reside upon. You know, the, um, we talk about transportation again, about the impact it has on our environment, but the thing that we don't talk about is agriculture. Um, agriculture has um, some devastating effects, and I won't get into the details about that because I think I'm not allowed to. Um, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> You know, we think about that, and it's not just about driving a plow into the field, tilling up the earth, throwing some seeds in the ground, and watering it. We have to change the way we farm. At Dream of Wild Health, we've begun to do that. Um, and so, of course, it's taking some trials and tribulations of experimenting with reduced till or no-till farming methods. It's also trying to build up the soil in something that um, more than 15 years ago couldn't hold a, a rye cover crop seed or a piece of rye grass seed. And it wouldn't grow, but now you can look at the soil and actually see and smell the organic matter within it. 
the project that we've we're evolving into is not just growing food and creating food access for the indigenous community of the Twin Cities. We are now exploring and planting uh, agroforestry systems. And for those of you who may not be familiar with that, it's instead of having a monocultured field of corn or soybeans, you have rows and alleyways made uh, with growing trees bushes, and all of those trees, bu bushes, uh, ground cover are different edible fruits, nuts, um, and berries. And so part of that is also um, establishing, or so, more so reestablishing what the ecosystem looked like before we started messing with it um, and changing the way that the earth showed us how to do it. These are different ways that we can all try to incorporate. Um, and, you know, although we're trying to make a change on 30 acres, 30 acres in the scheme of things is not very large at all. But I'm hoping it provides a way um, or a solution to try to work with what we have. Um, I know there are a lot of scary statistics, so I, I'm not trying to scare you. <laughs> And maybe that's why I get scared, um, just like Bob, uh, you know, is always thinking about solar. I guess I'm always thinking of, uh, you know, the worst worst case scenario and how we can avoid it. Um, but there's, not only are we combating climate chaos, um, but we're also, you know, like where is our topsoil? What's going to happen in the year 2050? You know, there's so many of these um, statistics that many of us will see in our lifetime. And if it's not something that we're going to see, it's something somebody we love will see. And what I'm hoping to impart upon all of you is not just that, you know, okay, maybe I'm not going to experience it, so it's not my problem. Um, but there's somebody coming behind you, whether that's a biological child or a niece or nephew or another loved one who's coming behind you and what type of life do you want them to have? Do you want them to figure out how they're going to grow their own food or what they're eating, uh, what they're ingesting? And what type of life do you want for them? I know we often talk about that in different indigenous communities and cultures we're always thinking about the seven generations or multiple generations that are coming, not only in front of us, but also behind us, and what that looks like. And, you know, whether that's something in your beliefs or um, that currently resides there, or it's something that you might want to uh, adapt, I'm more than willing to allow you all to adapt um, part of that mindset because once upon a time, somebody thought enough about us to make, uh, not only make these seeds continue to grow so we had them today, but also to make sure that we had other things, um, other things in this life that we can no longer take for granted. There, I think I said my piece about climate, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I know if I start talking about seeds, we'll be here all night. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, to think about the seeds, um, that's, you know, climate change is one of the, one of our main concerns as we're growing different seeds, because just like her, you know, growing up in the 1950s, or last time growing in the 1950s, we think about what the soil content used to look like. Um, we also think about, like, the temperature. Uh, what time of year was she planted? What time of year was she harvested? you know, like her days to maturity, like how is that affected by our weather? Um, and how is that affected also by um, soil that's been sort of stripped of a lot of those nutrients that we're trying to put back in? So it's not an easy task. Um, it's not easy, but it's also not impossible. Um, I am not somebody who grew up growing food. Um, when I had to spend time in the garden at home, it was more a punishment because I would have rather have been playing, um, but it's okay, you know, like, and now I have the opportunity to work with youth who would rather spend time in the garden than be out playing, so, um, so that's kind of a win and I get to see, uh, see the paradox of that, but, um, 
you know, what are we going to do? What else can we possibly do to make changes uh, to continue to have a hospitable planet where we can still grow seed, um, where we don't have to figure out how to grow something hydroponically or a place that we need to actually figure out how to get the water to grow something hydroponically. It's what we can do today or what we can do in a couple months when we have, uh, when we can see the earth again. So some of the other, um, we do a lot of indigenous steward, stewardship tactics, I guess, or techniques um, and different methods of being able to steward the earth. Um, it's not about tilling, it's all about relationships. Um, and it's not just the earth, it's being at the mercy of the earth and being at the mercy of the weather, um, also being at the mercy of wildlife who comes to visit the gardens too. It's knowing that we are no longer at, and we probably have never been, um, at the top of a pyramid. Um, and so it's remembering where our place is in the, the scheme of the world and life. Um, so it's being able to start that relationship. I hope that you all will continue to grow food. Um, but it's, you know, how can we form a relationship with the earth and continue to form relationships with each other so that way we can work collectively. Um, I think so many of us in this room are working on our own things, and that's great, but how can we multiply those? How can we multiply those efforts to truly make change? Um, I know Bob has his methods, I have my methods, um, and each and every one of you, whether you're recognized for them or not, have your own methods as well. Um, there's no mistake. Um, there's no mistake why we're all brought together this evening and sitting in this room together. Um, there's a reason why we're all here. And it's remembering that we are all, we are very small on the spectrum of life, but we all have the potential to create large change and to seek out those other solutions so we can build a better place and build a better world. And I know that might sound um, maybe a little too optimistic, uh, but I think that's what farmers do best, is that they're, <laughs> uh, they're optimistic about what to expect um, and sort of the grand scheme and visions of what the world could look like. And not only what the world could look like, but can we ever go back to where we were? Um, we've done a significant amount of damage um, to our natural resources as well as um, our food system within the last not even 100 years. So I'm hoping that each and every one of you can go home um, and start that relationship building, whether it's a small uh, five by five piece of earth that you uh, live at, or it's 100 acres of land. Um, I hope you will consider what you're doing um, and also what you're not doing. Um, and so, I hope you will also consider growing seed. Um, and growing seed is not only that act of resistance, but for every single year we grow our seeds, they become more resilient to climate change. Um, <clears throat> so although she hasn't, um, she hasn't been growing on a large scale for a very long time, she's now getting her chance to come back. And whether it's a dry season or a wet season, um, she's showing us and reminding us that we do still have the, the ability to persevere in a different and changing environment, but also how we can continue to show that and share that with the world too. How am I on time? <laughs> it's a little hard to see the clock. Um, and I think that's that's all I have for you this evening. Um, thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you both so much. You've given us so much to think about. Uh, we're going to start with um, questions. 
So as I mentioned at the beginning, if those of you who have questions would come to one of the mic microphones uh, so that we can hear you and so that the people on the live stream can hear the question. Um, and, uh, and then Jessica and Robert will, will discuss. I have, I have a question actually while we're, while we're waiting. Um, so, Jessica, could you tell us, actually, this is actually a question for both of you. Could you tell us a little bit more about rematriation? And, and I think one of the um, interesting points of connection in both of your, your talks is the idea of restoration, and restoration in terms of seeds, in terms of energy, and who controls where those things come from. Um, so I, I guess I'm asking you, Jessica, specifically about rematriation, um, but, but the question's really for both of you in that sense. Yeah, that's a great question, Tim. Um, <clears throat> rematriation, I think so many people are familiar with the term repatriation, where you know, there are um, deceased people, belongings, um, and things like that that have been placed in another country and now they're coming back to the states or back to the families that they belong to. And rematriation is focused more on the feminine energy of it. You know, in the scheme of the world, um, women are the carriers of life. Um, so uh, thinking of the reproductive system, but they're responsible for bringing life. And bringing life is also part of what seeds are. Um, so they are living beings um, that will plant, male or female will plant, um, but they have the capability to reproduce. And rematriation is not just the feminine energy around that, but it's also calling all of those seeds home from different museums, seed, public seed houses, institutions where they were collected, um, collected and sold without um, a lot of times without the knowledge of the, the home community who took care of them. Um, so I have a squash. This shouldn't take long, Tim. Um, no. I, there's well, a, I'm, um, I'm interested. <laughs> I, I could stay here all night. <laughs> so there was uh, once upon a time I had heard, um, I come from the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, the name that was given to us by the uh, French fur traders was the Winnebago. Um, and I was looking, looking through these jars and it said Winnebago squash. And I knew that that was something that my people had grown, um, had grown since probably the beginning of squash. Um, and I continued to look for it. I couldn't find anywhere who had that seed and a lot of times our indigenous seeds lose their name and lose their identity. Um, you know, there's, some of you are probably familiar with seeds like the Bloody Butcher, uh, which is a red corn, but that's not her name. Um, <laughs> she belongs to a tribe and a people. But um, that squash seed, I was obsessed. I knew somewhere it was out there. And rematriation, you know, I, I was at my computer for about 10 hours that day trying to find her. And I finally, got up from my desk and I printed out a picture of her that I had found in the Oscar Will Seed catalog back in the 1920s. And I told myself, I could sit on my computer all day long for the rest of my life and probably never find her. And so at that time, I said, you know what? If she comes, she comes. And if she doesn't, then it wasn't meant to be. About eight months later, um, I found her uh, and was reconnected with her, but she was going uh, under an assumed name. <laughs> um, and so since 2018, I've been able to grow with that squash and bring her back into our ceremonies and our communities and be able to share those seed with uh, other tribal members for them to grow her as well. Um, so that's part of rematriation. and. You know, like my understanding of seeds um, might be different than yours, but how I understand it is that they're living beings. 
Um, they sacrifice themselves to nourish us every day um, and every growing season. And so the thought of rematriation and seeds coming home is kind of like you always heard stories when you were growing up about Uncle Bob. Sorry. <laughs> um, and you didn't know Uncle Bob was still in this world with us. Um, you had just heard stories about him. And 50 years later, you hear a knock at the door and you open the door and it's Uncle Bob. And you had no idea he was still with us. And so Uncle Bob was living on his trajectory. You had your own. And now you have all of this time that you were apart. And that's exactly what it's like for the seeds. Um, it's truly like a, a coming home. And when you do get to consume uh, the fruits of those seeds, it feeds your spirit. And I think we probably all can relate to that, where you eat something maybe that your mother or your grandmother ate, and every time you eat it, it just makes you happy, or it makes you warm, um, and it makes you feel all of these positive things. Um, so that's what rematriation is like. Uncle Bob coming home and you didn't even know he was still around. Um, I'll uh, go ahead and second that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think rematriation, um, that's great, Tim, because um, I mean, I think it's about taking care of Mother Earth. I think it's taking, um, taking care of our planet, taking care of one another. Um, and, you know, um, uh, you know, I was raised by a single, a single mother, you know, and I mean, you know, and, and so, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, um, some of the things that I've seen in my lifetime are, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I think we, we got to take, uh, I think as men, we got to take better care, right, of, 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 of our, of our women. You know, like we got to be take we, we got to be real. We got to be, you know. I mean, because they're 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 the, they they carry the life. I mean, they're they're, they're the, in Ojibwe, they're the carriers of the water. You know, and and so I mean, uh, you know, that to me is really important. And, and 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 the piece about like you know when I speak to kids, when I talk about kids, and they ask me, like, why solar so important? You know. And I, and I tell them that, like, you know, the, the, the world is like a big stomach. And, and, it, it's as, it, and when it's sick, it's off. And, and we're off. And we're like, we're, we're, we're like this gut bacteria, right? And, 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 we're, and we're sick right now. And, 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 and the world is sick right now. And, and that's why you get people that are in Las Vegas casinos, you know, with type hard rifles taking down people. You know, we get all these we, we get all these bad things because we know we're hurting our mother. And, and 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 to me, you know, part of this healing has to come and we start taking care of her. And and and, and I and so I tell them, I say, I say, you know, like when you get sick, your 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 mommy and daddy give you medicine. Uh, you know, like, you know, that's what solar is for the plant for the planets, for, for the planet, for the planet's tummy. And I, got, I get them going like this, and then they'll start going like this. And they'll go, oh, okay, so solar's like medicine for the world's tummy. And I'm like, exactly, it's medicine for your mother, from your mother to your mother. And so that's what that means to me when I do my work, right? Like, I, I do believe there's a connection, that, that we're being mean to one another, that we need to start being right to one another, um, that, that we're doing this because we know that we're hurting our mother that 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 and, and and that's why we're acting out in the way that we are doing and and so you know we are connected to this planet more than you think you know and 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 uh, trees you know trees are so they have this intricacies that they're they're like they they like when one gets chopped down like they they feed it you know like you know it's all around us you know and and we're so blessed to like, I mean, you know, we're so incredibly lucky to have this little area where we can live. 100 feet up, we can't live. 100 feet down, we can't live. But right in this little area, we got to take care of it. And that's why I'm so passionate and why I do the work that I do. Thank you. Other questions? In 
inspiring to you as you as you kind of look ahead if you if that gives you some hope um you know um I, yeah i mean so like i think i know way too much about climate change because like <laughs> If I thought about everything I knew about this, I'd probably stop doing what I'm doing. But it's because of all of you that I continue my work because, you know, you guys are the future and, and, and like you inspire me. I get so many, I get, I, get so, I get such a kick out of being asked to come speak to high schools, to colleges, to, uh, you know, camps. I mean, I get, I always get asked to do this. And, and every time that I think my, my energy's down, like I hear a kid that says, oh, I wanna create my own solar bear. I wanna create my own native sun, Bob. I wanna do the stuff that you're doing. And it, and it, it, is, it just, it keeps me going, you know? And, and so, I mean, that's what, to me at least, um, is so inspiring when, when, I, when I hear back from like the youth. Um, I get emails from from I just got an email from a bunch of kids out in North Carolina that heard about me and they want to zoom me in to talk to their class you know like like it's, it's those kinds of things right like like that really uh, keeps me going and and then you know I, and then when I when I get to work with some of these young people that are doing some of this legislative work down at the Capitol and and um, they're, they're so excited to see me when I walk into the Capitol. They're like, Bob, 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 you know? <laughs> and it's just like, man, I mean, this is why I do it. I mean, it really is. And, um, you know, and, 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 and I'm so passionate about this project that I've been working on for the last couple years called the Solar Cub Program. And it's basically the solar bear family. Um, you know, imagine a bunch of polar bears with sunglasses coming down from the North Pole that come into a Native American village. And they tell, and they tell the, the clan animals that our, our home is melting and we need your help. And, and, and so, the, so the clan animals say, we can help you, but we have to have the humans help too. And this comes in the Native American girl. And so now the, now the kids can see themselves as part of the solution. And so um, we got, I'm, I'm collaborating with PBS uh, on this project. We, we, we got a half a million dollars to start the work on it. Um, Disney Foundation has contacted me on it. So, is really exciting, you know, uh, because, and, and, and I, I tell them when I speak to them, you know, that, you know, I think it's so important that we get this kind of education to these kids, to, to, the, to the schools, because, you know, we're leaving them with a mess. We're leaving them, and, and, when the, and, the, and what I hope the bears do, what the solar bears do for the kids is I hope, I hope that what they do is they give these kids the, the, the tools that, they, that they're going to need to fight climate change. Right, and, and and so as they're facing this this existential problem, they're going to sit there and say, "Oh, the bears taught me how to deal with this," and they're not going to put their heads in the sand and like you know turn to drugs or alcohol or something else, right? And so that's why I'm really passionate about this um, because they're really the answer. They're they're going to be the solution, and and um, yeah, man. Now the, the the kids are the best, man. They're awesome. Oh, and by the way, the kids came into our chair, my chairman's office, and they were looking for Solar Bear. They said, oh, they, they come in, they go boom, boom. Hey, uh, they all came in, they said, uh, Chairman Siki, um, uh, where's Solar Bear at? <laughs> and, and then my chairman was like, I wish I had Bob Blake here <laughs> to come and talk to the kids. Um, but, you know, absolutely. I'm so stoked about the kids because they have so much enthusiasm and, and, and I'm so excited for how they see the planet as opposed to maybe some of us adults where we're a little bit more cynical, you know? Yeah, I think uh, for me, if it weren't for the kids, I would not continue to do what I'm doing. Um, I know before I came to Dream of Wild's Health, um, you know, there's a lot of times you feel hopeless. Um, I don't want to say hopeless. The, the work is never ending on a farm. Um, and you know, I had the opportunity to come to Dream of Wild Health and I saw kids finishing their lunch and asking if they could come out and weed with me. Um, and there's, you know, you look into the faces of these kids um, who are, you know, essentially our replacements. We need to give them all the tools that we possibly can and make them better than we are today. And 
looking in their faces, I know that we have to get it right. I can't, I can't fail them, and I know that's a lot to carry, but it's also really what keeps me going every day is knowing that I need to make it better for them. Um, and I'm hoping that everything that we do, we continue to learn our lessons, um, but also continue to build up that system for them to inherit. More questions? Jessica, I'm curious about the uh, seed. Um, I don't know how to express it exactly, but you're getting seeds um, from um, areas of uh, from seed houses and maybe seed vaults. And are you uh, then providing seeds back to those those same um, repositories, or how does that network work? Yeah, that's a great question, Royal. Um, so the seeds. We do have a, a long-standing partnership with Seed Savers Exchange located down in Iowa. Um, and you know they're a large uh, public heirloom open pollinated seed company. Um, the, um, there have been indigenous people who are on the board um, or who were put onto the board a few years ago. And since then, they have taken all of the indigenous seeds out of their sale catalog um, brought it back into their vaults and are only sharing those seeds with the people of those communities. Um, and so we've, you know, it started off small. Seed Savers was growing 25 varieties, uh, had planned to grow 25 varieties each year. But when you have thousands and thousands of seed, that's something that will go on forever. Um, and so we've worked on a, a SARE partnership grant where we have other indigenous growers who um, also check out at least five different varieties of seed. And we grow them uh, for us. I, I grow them at my own farm in Wisconsin, but also at Dream of Wild Health. And after, after the harvest time, then those seeds go back to their home communities. Um, so we use our network of other seed growers or tribal farms uh, to be able to return their seeds to them. Other questions? Can I, can I, I'm gonna ask a follow-up about that, and um, th this hasn't come, come up yet, but can you talk about intellectual property and IP law? So, <laughs> um, there have been lots of different, um, you know, there have been different states like New, Me New Mexico that have tried to um, protect the intellectual properties around seed as well as like the cultural knowledge attached to those seeds. And also part of that is also preventing uh, cross-contamination with GMO crops or GMO corn, genetically engineered crops. Um, there are there are places that our seeds belong and there are places they do not belong um, and if we want to get to the relationship of things you know like there are things that I will not share um, because um, just like I talk with the youth about and it's easy to think about uh, some of our youngsters they know who's growing at the farm they know where, which community those seeds come from and where maybe they're going back to, um, but we don't talk about who they are um, because each of those seeds are, have their own superpowers and are superheroes in their own, in their own, in their own way. Um, and they have different benefits, not only for the soil, but also for the other crops that they're growing with um, in like a three sisters system or just intercropping with other crops. Um, so that's sort of where that's at. Um, you know, I feel like when we expose some of those uh, superhero powers, we make our seeds more vulnerable to people who want to be able to patent it and sell it. Um, and I wouldn't turn to any one of you and patent you and then try to sell you either. Um, and that's how 
um, you know, these seeds are my relatives. Um, it may be something that I'm able to hold in my hand, but seeds are our past, our present, and our future all at the same time. And if I look at these seeds, once upon a time, my ancestors looked at the exact same cob. And it's knowing that everything I do has to be able to protect that from cross-contamination, but also exploitation. Any more questions? I, I want to thank you both so much for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we've learned a lot. and. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Jessica Greendeer and Robert Blake. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>